Barry Flinchbaugh was one of America's leading experts on agricultural policy for the last few decades. But friends and family alike would probably agree that his greatest joy was teaching. Whether enlightening legislators on Capitol Hill, lecturing to students at Kansas State University, or sharing information with farmers and ranchers at K-State Research and Extension field days and workshops, Barry Flinchbaugh was always ready to share his knowledge with anyone who was interested, and he did it with unmistakable flair. Here now is audio from one of his most well-known and frequently referenced presentations, Kings and Kingmakers. This was recorded at K-State Research and Extension's 2017 annual conference held on the K-State campus. Here now is Barry Flinchbaugh. Good morning. morning. At age 75, John, I like to hear that repeated. (laughs) Uh, uh, It's music to my ears, so I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I don't want you to get a big head or anything, but you certainly are my favorite audience, Uh, fellow extension people and research, etc. I've been here 46 years, so we go way back. So thank you for the opportunity to to be here this morning and to talk about kings and kingmakers. Uh, I cut my eye teeth beginning in 1971 as an extension specialist on the Kansas tax issue. In fact, that's what I was hired to do Um, when I first came to Kansas. Uh, It was hot. Everybody was uptight. The issue when you ask the man on the street was the taxes are too high. And I would begin those presentations by saying, um, mine is too high, but I don't know about yours. (laughs) Certainly you could pay more. And that put it, uh, brought reality back from the politics. Because the issue wasn't, are taxes too high? The issue was the tax mix, the real problem. The famous three-legged stool. I get credit for coining that term. I don't know for sure if that's true or not, but I think the history book will record it that way. Property, sales, and income. That's the three-legged stool. And those of you who follow public issues and public affairs know that we've just gone through that same issue. Uh, Many years later from when we first started talking about it in 1971. Uh, One of my old professors at Purdue, Earl Butts, always told his students, Never throw away your notes because public issues reoccur and you can dig them out and have another go around. (laughs) Um, Public decision making, public policy making, we use those terms interchangeably, interchangeably. It's not simple. And it sure as hell isn't logical. Uh, But it is practical. Um, I think my favorite all-time story, some of you have heard it before. Uh, You thought it was funny the first time you heard it, and I expect your cooperation at 8 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) These three brothers all graduated from the same school. And while they were students, they would go to Aggieville, And they would drink together every Friday night. Well, they graduated and went separate ways. How are they going to do this? Because they promised each other they'd always drink together every Friday night. So one of them became a country lawyer, and he went into the local bar, and he ordered three beers. And he sat there and sipped the three beers all at the same time. And he did this week after week, and the bartender finally got up enough of 
Moxie to ask him, what are you doing? If you just ordered one at a time, you'd always have fresh beer. So he began to tell the bartender the story, that his other two brothers were drinking three beers in different towns, and they were honoring their pledge of drinking together every Friday night. One night he came in and he ordered two beers. The bartender got worried. Started to extend his sympathy. And the country lawyer kind of grinned and said, Oh, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. Everybody's fine. Uh, Well, why did you just order two beers then? And the old boy said, Well, my wife coerced me last Sunday, into joining the Baptist church. (laughs) And I took a no drinking pledge. (laughs) But it didn't apply to my two brothers. (laughs) That is the best story I've ever heard that explains the public decision-making process. It's not logical. And it is certainly not simple. Now on the screen is what I would call a general framework of how public decisions are made. And think about your hometown, your county seat town, your county. Uh, Think about your community. And regardless of whether you're talking about the next farm bill or abortion, this diagram holds. Just simply take a look at it. Study it for a moment. Um, We'll go through it very briefly. We call this how public decisions are made. And then we'll spend most of our time on who makes public decisions, which is the king's and kingmaker approach. This diagram in front of you describes the process, and it holds, as I just said, for all issues at all levels, facts, myth, and values. What is what isn't, and what should be. There is an old saying, it gets attributed to Winston Churchill, lots of things get attributed to him that he probably stole from somebody else, but uh, he would say frequently, in a democracy, everyone is welcome to his or her own set of values, but not his or her own set of facts. That's the premise on which we begin. Myth is what people think is fact, but through research and empirical observation, etc., cetera, uh, we can disprove it. But the interesting thing about myth, and just look at today's politics, and this will hit home hard. Myth is treated by the public the same as fact. In fact, myth is treated by the President of the United States the same as fact. (laughs) This is occurring in the public decision-making process. What should be is based on values. Everybody, remember, is welcome to their own set of values. And this is what leads to who makes public decisions. Now, some of you, I'm certain, are aware that I'm no electronic genius. I think I've got two slides. I think we can get to the second one. (laughs) This is the famous or infamous diagram that 
Many of you old timers at least have uh, seen many times and you youngins that are just getting started, this will be a good lesson for you. Uh, think of your hometown now. Think of the county seat town. Now, your first grade teacher, God bless her, she lied to you when she said all men are created equal. And now, of course, it's all men and women are created equal. That's not the way the system works. When Bob Dole was the Senate Majority Leader, Kansas had a lot more power than California because the Majority Leader sets the calendar for the day. And this idea that every state has two senators and therefore the 50 are equal is just not true. Your first grade teacher lied to you. Now, who makes public decisions back home in your county or your town? And if you're on the state staff, who makes public decisions in Manhattan, Kansas? Uh, that is an interesting process to follow. That's what we're going to dig into. Now, before you females start throwing something at me, the term kingmaker and king is gender neutral. <laughs> I could not find a substitute that put across what I wanted to put across. And we will spend a few minutes talking about uh, the role of women in this process. We'll spend a few minutes talking about can you inherit kingmaker status. And then we'll bring it up to the days of social media. Every community has a handful of people. We call them kingmakers. They possess two sets of resources. In this order, we're going to destroy a myth. The myth today is that money buys votes, money runs the country, end of story, that's all you need to know. That's a myth. Two sets of resources. Number one is intellectual. Number two is financial. I'm not arguing that money does not play a role. But I have known lots of kingmakers that are of average wealth. I've never met a dumb kingmaker. They all have superior intellectual ability. Then if they have a little cash, that obviously helps. But it's in that order, financial second and intellectual first. They're at least middle age, and they have experience. Now, you have, may have been in your county for quite a while, and you think you know who they are, and you don't. I've been in this state 46 years. I've worked with the agriculture community 46 years, and I don't know who all the kingmakers are in Kansas agriculture. Because, number one, they have a goal. They don't want you to know who they are. They want to operate behind the scenes. They don't want their name in the newspaper. They don't show up at your meetings. But they're represented. They send the kings. They're very difficult to identify. It's very hard to do. They will deny that they have any influence. What they'll say, smile at you. Who, me? I don't have any influence. I just do what's good for this community. 
Now, I can't give you a foolproof way of identifying them. I can give you a foolproof way to know who they are not. If they brag about it, if they tell you how much influence they have, you can just write them off. They don't have any. They're just blowing steam. It's called, in the Kansas vernacular, bullshit. <laughs> just pure and simple. So ignore them. Don't pay any attention to them. Now, they work to get their own self-interest. These people aren't purists. They work to get their own self-interest and the common interest to merge. Now, think about who they are in your community. I obviously, I've been in every county at least three times, but not lately, so... I won't know names. I'm not interested in names. Uh, this is a difficult room to do this in, but just shout at me. Who do you think are kingmakers in your hometown by occupation? Who are they? Bankers. Bankers, okay. Who's? Come on. Newspaper editors. Newspaper editors. Uh, we'll hold that one for a minute, but okay, next. Come on. You've lawyers. lawyers, okay. Keep going. MDs, all right. If you're a home director, they'll get you eventually, so, you know. <laughs> um, and they are influential. Major landowner. Major landowner. Uh, land's been in the family maybe for three, four generations. School superintendents, we'll hold that one for a minute. Ministers. ministers, we'll hold that one for a minute. So now we got ministers and school teachers. What was the third one? Yeah. Newspaper editors, okay. Well, um, You're arguing that that MD or that lawyer is not a female. Or if you're talking spouse, then you're talking about the husband. Uh, in the old days, there was something called pillow talk. Uh, we used to joke, the old timers will remember, that was the problem with Bill and Hillary. They never had their head on the same pillow. <laughs> you see, so... Uh, but yeah, the pillow talk still goes on. Uh, I got asked at a meeting a while back, uh, what are we going to do about Trump's tweeting? And I thought I had the answer, and I said, we must insist that Melania move to Washington <laughs> from New York. She has, and hell, it's gotten worse, <laughs> you see. So that wasn't the right answer. So... Um, Go way back to the first president that I had the privilege of knowing, Harry Truman. Uh, he spent every evening discussing every issue on his plate with Bess. She was very influential, and nobody knew it. So, yes, but in this day and age, spouse goes both ways. Okay, anybody else want to add something? PTO president? No. Okay. Main business Say that again. Business owner. business owner. Many county seat towns have one large employer. Um, Osborne Manufacturing, for example. And they're obviously very influential because they're the biggest employer in town. Um, Occasionally I'll get asked, or somebody will complain about them, and I always get in trouble with this, but at age 75, you know, who gives a damn, but here we go. Um, people make a smart remark about this big bureaucracy in Manhattan, and I'll say, you shouldn't talk about the Farm Bureau like that. 
you see. So uh, there's more than one bureaucracy in town. Other suggestions? We pretty well have them. Now, this changes with how people behave, and it certainly changes with technology. If you had to name the, one of the top five influential people in the United States today, who would you name? Okay. Who else? Bill Gates. Koch brothers. Buffett. Okay. Gates and Zuckerberg are on there because of technology. 25 years ago, they wouldn't have been. So it changes with technology. The most influential man in Detroit used to be the buggy whip manufacturer. Uh, Henry Ford took care of him, you see. So it changes. Now, newspaper editor. If the editor and the publisher is the same individual and they live in town, yes, the Seton family is quite influential in Manhattan, Kansas. But one of the things that's happened with the newspaper business is the owner isn't the editor anymore, or the owner lives uh, in Denver and owns six, eight, ten county seat town newspapers. And that decreases the influence of the newspaper. Uh, you need to live in the community and partake in community activities. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they don't have any influence, but they certainly don't have the influence to the degree that Huck Boyd had, for example, when I came here, because he lived in Phillipsburg, Kansas. So you, the locale has something to do with it. Ministers. Uh, ministers, I would argue, have lost influence because a certain percentage of them have become political. And we don't go to church Sunday morning, and less of us go. We don't go there to be told how to vote. And that is the number one goal of some of these ministers. And they have given some of the legitimate ministers a bad name. And they've clearly lost influence. School teachers, school superintendents. Uh, especially in the larger towns, they belong to a union. And that makes them less professional. And they don't, don't have the influence today they did just a decade ago. I went to a country school, eight rooms. There are eight, eight grades, one room. Uh, the teacher was my, what we called affectionately in those days, it's not politically correct anymore, but she was known as my old uh, maid aunt. And she had a school board because the law required she had a school board. Uh, my dad was on the school board and he corrected her one night and she had him in class and she looked at him and she said, do you remember the time I whipped you? Yeah, well, if you don't shut up, it's going to happen again, you see. <laughs> she didn't need a school board. Well, there's no teacher that influential anymore, I don't think. Um, now, tell me, see, I'm getting old, I can't remember. What was the third one? Newspaper editor, teacher, we, oh, we've got all three of them, minister. Now, somebody brought up Undertaker. And now... This is a good example of how technology and occupation and the state of the art of the business affects who has influence, who's the kingmaker. It was very common in 1900 in Kansas. Every county seat town or most every county seat town had a very influential person 
who was the undertaker and the furniture maker. If you could build a chest of drawers, you could build a pine box. And you sent an order to Kansas City for formaldehyde, and you were in business. And there are still a few towns left. Downs, Greensburg, any others? It, it changed. Okay, any other towns? See, it's dwindling. But why? No funeral director builds a casket. Most of them come from Indiana. Uh, the furniture store owner doesn't make the furniture. They come from worldwide or at least nationwide brand names. So technology changes it. And just think about what social media has done to it. And we'll put that off for a second and talk about it um, in a few minutes. Now, another misunderstanding about the influence of the kingmakers. They do not represent the status quo. The last thing they want is to lose influence. They don't want kicked out, so to speak, even though this is an, that's an informal process. There's nothing legal about that diagram. Um, it's just the real world. So, when the winds of change reach gale force, they're going to blow with them. The kingmakers you know, see how they use social media. And I would bet they all have a smartphone. You see, they blow with the winds of change because they want to maintain their influence. And they have a unique ability to understand it when things are changing. And they will begin to guide that change and maintain their influence. Many of them are still influential when they meet their undertaker, those that will change. So this is not the status quo. Now, hopefully, the, my predecessor, whoever that may be, makes this speech 20 years from now. The role of women will not be on the agenda. And we're getting close. My favorite story of the traditional role of women is about a banker in northwest Kansas. The way a female became a kingmaker when I came here, for example, was she had a famous father, Nancy Landon Kassebaum, Alf Stoddard, who, if I was forced to pick, to pick my favorite politician that, that I've known over the years, it would be Nancy. Uh, she lives out in the countryside in Morris County, and um, I think she's lonely, but she won't admit it. She gets more like Alf every day, and I told her that not long ago, and she said, you mean I'm stubborn? And I said, you knew your father, so, uh, <laughs> but, um, but my favorite story is about this banker in um, northwest Kansas, and she became a kingmaker because she had a very influential husband, uh, the only bank in town. He died of a heart attack very young. They had the funeral took care of the burial, etc. That Monday morning, she went into the bank 
she took down his name tag, her plate, and she put up her name, and it said president and CEO. And she ran that bank for 25 years. And I would use her as an example across the state. And one day I got a phone call, and I got my butt chewed just about as good as it's ever been chewed. It's still sore. (laughs) And you quit using me as an example. I don't have any influence. That's rule number one. She's denying it. Uh, I had no choice. I had to run this bank. And I said, well, you had a son and a daughter. Well, Art wanted me to do it. And it used to be a joke out in that neighborhood to watch them tough, rough, cussing cowboys come in to get a loan from Harriet. Now, some of you can figure it out, perhaps. She's gone. But she was an Emerson character, and she certainly was the kingmaker. Uh, Women now climb the ladder on their own. They don't need a famous father. They don't need a husband that died relatively young. They can climb the ladder on their own. They're professionals, lawyers, um, medical doctors. And one we didn't mention, veterinarians. Some of you will remember the farm protest movement in the 80s that was led by two veterinarians. So, professional people, uh, business people, smart people, enough of money to get their point across, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, You may have been in the county for 25 years. I would bet there's at least one of them you don't know. Um, Very difficult. To figure it out. So that's the very top of the triangle. Next in line are the kings. This is who the general public thinks makes the decisions. And formerly they do. County and city commissioners, legislators, they vote. They're the local leadership. They behave exactly opposite of the kings. I've had politicians tell me, bad publicity is better than no publicity. We've got to keep our name out there. Um, They love to have their name in the newspaper. They come to your meetings. And then they go home. And they get the kingmaker on the telephone and explain to he or she what happened. Uh, Women are playing a a much more active role in uh, being city commissioners, county commissioners, etc. today. Uh, Now, it needs to be understood. And some people don't like to hear this. It needs to be understood that behind every king, there is a kingmaker. There are no exceptions. I would challenge you to find one. That's the reason I stick with these terms, kingmaker and king. And remind you that I'm using it in a general a gender-neutral way. Uh, so you need to interpret this literally. King beggars and kings. Now let me tell you a story about one time I was in Garden City. And I, all these people are gone, so I think I can tell it. I won't use any names. But I was giving this speech, and a local legislator was in the audience, and I could just tell he was doing a slow burn. And he got more and more uncomfortable, and it just kept going till he exploded. And he said back to me, 
God damn, I don't take orders from anybody. And he said it publicly. And don't you tell this crowd that I listened to a kingmaker. It's a true story. He was defeated at the next election. Perfect evidence. That's right, he didn't listen to the kingmaker. Made a damn fool out of himself and he got beat. The kingmaker found a new king. So, I've never experienced knowing a person in public office that didn't have at least one kingmaker and many two or three that advised them behind the scenes. And no, their purpose wasn't just to line their own pocket because they value being a kingmaker. And they, what they really try to do is to get their self-interest and the common interest to merge. Then everybody's happy. Uh, next in line are the actives. Uh, these are young professionals uh, working their way up the ladder. They're civic-minded. They belong to service clubs. If they belong to the Kiwanis Club, they sell Tootsie Rolls. If they belong to the Lions Club, they sell brooms. And if they're um, elitist, arrogant Rotarians, which I am, (laughs) they wouldn't get caught dead selling anything. (laughs) They give their money. If there is a family in town that's in trouble, uh, an accident, a uh, fatal disease, and left a young wife and three or four kids. The actives, the joiners, will organize a fund drive for them. Um, here in Manhattan, quite a few years ago, we couldn't get the state to paint the bridge, so the active citizens painted the bridge. Um, They do the work of the community. They're on their way up. They're climbing the ladder. They will be future kings. And some of them may actually be a future king maker. And you notice as we go down this diagram, we get more people. The next group is interested. They read the newspaper. They may read USA Today. They watch cable TV. They're loyal to Fox or MSNBC or perhaps CNN. And therein lies the problem of the division today. Uh, Fox is a Republican organization. MSNBC is a Democrat organization. And CNN tries to straddle the middle, but they don't get it done very well. And they are clearly contributing to the division that we are now experiencing. If you get your news from someone that always agrees with you, you don't understand what's going on in the world. Then you get on Facebook, and your friends all agree with you. And if they don't, you just pass them by on Facebook. And it contributes to some of the division that we now have. And the interested bunch tends to fall for this. They will discuss issues. Uh, The Internet has become a larger version of the coffee shop. And those of you that go to a coffee shop in this town or in your, you go into the coffee shop in your county seat town and the old farts are in there. And that's the source of all wisdom. 
Just ask them. And the only difference now is that the Internet has become the coffee shop, and it is speedier. Uh, I've been going to the same barber here in town for 46 years, and he's, uh, he's much better at trimming beards than he is hair, and I don't have my, you know, there's more hair here than up here. So, but in the old days, it was a joke in this town, you know, just tell Ira, uh, don't waste your money on an ad in the Manhattan Mercury, just tell Ira. Uh, or the fire chief. Uh, those two knew what was going on. But that was slow. Now, Ara Jr. gets on the Internet and social media. And, of course, he spreads it much faster than he's dead. So nothing has changed in terms of who's influential in the process. Uh, but it's quicker. It's speedier. That's one of the reasons we have more controversy. Um, we live now, whether we like it or not, in the age of Twitter. The president had three Twitters, Twitters this morning, so uh, that's the age we're in. Now, the interested group may or may not vote. The actives and the kings and the kingmakers always vote. The interested group usually vote in the general election, but not in the primary. The interested group is, tends to be uh, somewhat moderate. Um, and then when they get to the general election, um, you know, they don't have anybody to vote for. And they complain about that. Well, my answer to them is, did you vote in the primary? No. Well, then you're the problem, you see. Um, then at the bottom, uh, my secretary made this, of course, and she always cleans it up. I've had the same secretary for 30 years, and we're going to go out together someday. Um, and you all know who the boss is if you've met Mary. Um, this is supposed to say, do not give a damn bunch. <laughs> Instead, it says apathetic citizens. And guess who put that in there? <laughs> now, they won't talk about public issues very much. Uh, I used to call them Joe Sixpack and Roseanne Barr, and of course the young folks don't have any idea who Roseanne was. Um, and Archie Bunker used to be in this speech, too, but uh, uh, <laughs> he would sure have a lot to say today, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, they just don't vote. They bitch and complain. And there, a lot of them are happy. Uh, some of them did vote in the last presidential election, and you all know the outcome. Uh, now, there is a way to move the apathetic up the ladder to active. It happens all the time. If it is announced that the new highway around the town is going to come through their front yard, they will quickly move from apathetic to interested. Many of you remember the American agriculture movement and the farm protest of the mid-80s. Uh, they drove their tractors to Washington, if you remember. Now, farm organizations are still very active, but they use the Internet instead of their tractors. Um, the famous... Example is damn near as old as I am, so, but it's still, it, it's an amazing example. You all know that there's a reservoir out here, Tuttle Creek, some of the best farmland in the valley. 
And the farmers formed an organization and they'd been totally apathetic up until then. Somebody was very clever. They called it Big Damn Foolishness. And they got real active. The Secretary of the Interior came out to visit. Uh, he was an uncle of Ed Seaton. And when he flew over the site, one of the farmers shot at the helicopter. Thank God he missed him. Um, but his activism ended up in Leavenworth. So, But there are examples of that throughout history. The current health care debate, I would argue, has some of that, those aspects to it. Uh, when a congressman goes home today and tries to hold a town meeting, uh, the health care activists are there. And they were part of the don't give a damn bunch until they've discovered right or wrong, that they may lose their health care. So it's issue-oriented. Uh, they can certainly move from apathetic to active. And the kings and the kingmakers pay attention to that. Uh, no question that they get that, uh, their attention. If you look at this internationally, and I've given this speech in uh, an Eskimo tribe in Alaska, um, Communist Party meeting in uh, Brno, the old Czechoslovakia, for example. And they all agree that the form of this diagram holds in any political system. So you can get the attention, even in the Communist Party system, you can get the attention of the kings and the kingmakers. And a good example a couple years ago was in Cairo, Egypt, uh, when the people were starving and food became very expensive. They got out their smartphones and they produced the Arab Spring and they uh, toppled the dictator. Uh, so uh, it works around the world. Now, to close this down and respond to some questions... I have till 9.15, right? Yeah, okay. What is the role of the educator in this system? What is your role? E even today, as nasty as the system has become, as partisan as it's become, uh, you still have a role, and you you have a more effective role today, I think, than you've ever had. So I'm kind of jealous. I'd like to be um, 30 again and work through it. The role of the educator. The system today desperately needs objective information. How did I survive that tax system debate? I stayed objective. I jumped in bed with nobody except I married the home economist from Phillipsburg, you see. So, um, true story. Um, now, I'm old and feeble, and she had to drive me here today, you see. So, But what do you do? You establish the fact. You do it through empirical observation, through research, etc. You destroy the myth. You analyze the alternative solutions to the problem and their probable consequences. You don't make the decision. You don't campaign for the results. You don't pick a favorite alternative. You avoid value judgments. Every public issue has to be solved in the political arena by applying value judgments. What should be? And that's not your role as an educator. Now, I am firmly convinced, after 46 years in Kansas doing this, and four years in Indiana, that makes 50, that eventually the system produces 
and it's hard to accept this at the moment, given the uh, the partisan battles and so forth. I'm firmly convinced that the system will produce what Harry Truman called horse sense. It may take a while, but it happens. Uh, Harry Truman introduced Medicare in 1946, and Lyndon Johnson signed it in 1966. It takes a while. A news reporter said to President Truman, you certainly have a unique ability of making decisions, which he did. And finally, the reporter said, well, just how do you do it? And he said, well, I bring in the experts. I try to gather the facts. I apply horse sense and make a decision. And the news reporter said, well, that's fine. But what's horse sense? And Harry grinned and said, it's something that a mule doesn't have. I've got 10 minutes for questions, right, roughly? <laughs> now, you can either sit here and look at me, or you can ask a question. <laughs> yes? Can you inherit being a key maker, or do you have to work your way up the ladder? I was going to talk about that, and I didn't. Let me, uh, so, thank you. Uh, the, uh, there's no definitive answer to that. You can he inherit the money, but you may not inherit the intellect. Um, there is a family in this state, I won't name them, but it was thought their political influence was over. And it would have been if we stayed in the old male chauvinistic system. Uh, the son inherited the mo some of the money. Uh, something happened to the smarts. Somebody jumped the fence or something. <laughs> but until it was acceptable to have a female in public office, that family's influence was gone, but it became acceptable, and they're still very influential today. Um, so it, it helps to have a famous name, but it also can be a liability because more is expected. And the old rule of the third generation, which still holds to a degree, uh, the first generation establishes the foundation, the second generation expands it, and the third generation blows it. Uh, still holds to a degree. So, yeah, I appreciate that question. I skipped over too lightly. Next question. One more. One more. So, Barry, this may be a similar question, but in a different way. Is there a, a process when a kingmaker dies and it's not going to be passed down to the family? How is that void filled within a community? Uh, that's an excellent question. And if you, there's two communities in this state that I have follow very closely. And I won't tell you who they are because only a few of you know that I've been following them very closely for 46 years. And they compete with each other. And they have similar geographic and uh, even soil type. Uh, there, there's really nothing different about the two, roughly, except leadership. And in my 46 years watching them, uh, they've changed who's on top twice. And they change 
when there is a change in leadership. And it's not a, the kingmaker dies and we appoint a new kingmaker the next day. It's a slow evolutionary process. It takes time. Uh, it's dynamic. It's not static. Now, when the kingmaker starts to get old, um, the youngins are plotting who's going to take his or her place. Um, it's kind of like putting a young bull in the pasture and the old bull don't like it. And it takes a while for him to fight it out. Um, that's kind of a crude way of putting it, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it is planned to a degree because we, we know the kingmaker's getting some age on him. And so there may be a half a dozen younger ones that are kind of competing for his influence. But it may take four or five years. And the community is static. Uh, the community may lose business. Uh, they lose, uh, they're less competitive with their neighbors, etc. cetera. Um, it's very interesting to watch this town at the present time. Uh, we have a new general at the fort. And we got an old general as president of the university, uh, a four-star general that was the chief of staff, of the joint chiefs of staff of each military branch, Richard Marks. Um, his wife is a native of Manhattan, I've, and her father taught me Kansas politics. So I've known the family for a long time. Uh, a new president here will take several years to get very influential. Well, he's General Marks. Now, he'd deny this if he was here. Um, and he walked in here with tons of influence. And he knows how to work, surprisingly, with students and faculty, which is about the opposite of working in the military. Uh, so if you have the right name uh, and the right experience, it can change overnight. But it normally takes, uh, it, it's an evolutionary process, not a revolutionary process. Well, it's been a real honor for me to talk to you. I didn't hesitate when John called me. And I was dead serious when I said at the beginning that I'm talking to my favorite audience. Um, the extension service and the experiment station um, still get the job done, get it done well. Um, and I think there's a new era of appreciation coming down the road uh, for extension and, the, and research through an experiment station. So. I came here 46 years ago. My folks were upset. They thought that, uh, well, the only thing they knew about Kansas was um, Matt Dillon and Miss Kitty. <laughs> and when I took them to Dodge City, they were absolutely thrilled. Uh, I told them I would be home in three years. Um, you know, I've been here 46, and there's a cemetery lot up on the hill, so I'm staying. <laughs> Thank you. You've been listening to Barry Flinchbaugh's presentation, Kings and Kingmakers, recorded at K-State Research and Extension's 2017 Annual Conference on the campus of Kansas State University. Flinchbaugh died on November 2nd, 2020. He was 78 years old.